tackle something that we've all struggled with. And I say that every week because we all struggle with all these things that we're dealing with. But especially today, we're going to deal with something that we have come up against somewhere in our life, especially when we try to apply faith to life. It's called the role of rules. The rules. What do the rules play? How do the rules go along with our faith? How do we use the rules in our faith and what kind of role uh, do they play? Because in every religion, no matter what religion you there are these pesky things called rules. And you will bump up against them no matter what religion you've tried, what religion you're in right now. You have run up against the rules at some point. And you've had to do, and, and you've had to deal with it. And there's always a rule maker. And guess who it never is? Us. We don't get to make the rules. I mean, how many, wouldn't it be cool if we just started our own religion and made up the rules? I mean, I got some ideas. I got, I got some ways that I think this thing would work a little better than God did. And if I could just make my own religion, I think everything would be much easier. But we all want to do that. But no matter what religion, we all run up on the rules. Uh, Islam has the five pillars of Islam. And, and they follow along with those. There's the Ten Commandments. There's the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Sikhism, uh, one of the largest growing religions right now, it has a long, long, long uh, list of rules. Buddhists, they have principles. Uh, they have principles and then they also have tests. So if you want to join them, there's, there's some principles you have to buy into and then you have to perform some tests. And, and you know, Christians, they're really weird. They have the set of rules and then they have versions uh, of those rules. Uh, you have Catholic and you have Protestant. And then you take the Protestant and you break them up into all kinds of what we call denominations. So we have versions upon versions upon versions of the rules. And for many of you, that's what you run up against. Is maybe in a version of a rule that you don't even know the original rule to. You know, I grew up Baptist. There's a lot of rules. A lot of rules don't even make sense. There's a lot of rules to keep you from doing things that you might actually do if you break one of the rules. Doesn't make sense. That's why Baptists don't dance, because they're afraid everybody who dances has sex. Seriously. That's why you can't dance. That's the key. Well, no, I can't. Never mind. I'm not even going with that one. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. not. But there, there, there's, all these, there's all these rules. And every, every denomination, Methodist, they got a few. They can get away with a lot more stuff than we can. Uh, Presbyterians, they, they, they got a whole bunch of them. But everywhere you go, you will find a set of rules that you need to, that you need to kind of work in. And, and when you have rules, what you have is rule monitors. Anybody know any rule monitors? Ro, 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 ro. You know, God love them. They got the gift of watching out when you break a rule. And you never invite them over to dinner. You never, you never have them near you. You know, that you just touch, talk to them when you're at church. And you try to talk to them from across the church. Because you're afraid they're going to pick up on one of the fact that you've broken a rule. But that's kind of where we are. In church life, but more importantly, in our Christian life. We're rubbing up against the rules and we don't know what to do. So I'm going to ask the question, what's up with all the rules? And what kind of part do they play in our life? Because to be honest, the rules are what you're rebelling against. You're not rebelling against God. You're not rebelling against Jesus. You're rebelling against the rules. You're rebelling against the things that you would like to do, and that's what's causing you to run and hide. That's what caused you to drop out of church for a little while. That's what causes you to get mad at people, because you are rebelling against the rules. You want to do something that there's a rule against, and you do it anyway, and then somebody fusses at you. And in reality, the rules don't seem to work in the real world. So we're going to talk about the rules in kind of a general way. We're going to ask the question, what's the relationship between rules and religion? Or another way, is there a starting point and how do the rules play in to your restarting your faith? How do the rules become a part of your faith and not run your faith? And how do they actually fit into the right way that God has planned them? But here's our premise we've got to go on. Rules always assume a relationship. Think about it. No matter where you are, if there are rules involved, there's a relationship attached to it. Everywhere, everywhere there's a rule. Whether it's a secular group or a religious group, 
when you find yourself confronted with a set of rules, there's a relationship attached. Here's a couple of categories. If you want to write these down, we're going to kind of use them as we go, but we're going to, there's the family model of rules. And these categories were kind of made up by another pastor friend of mine, so we're just using his categories. There's another way you can write them, and that's fine. If you come up with a better way, write that. But the family model is you were born into a family, and you were brought up in a family, and then your parents started making rules. Is that everybody? You're born, wasn't a lot of rules there. And as you started to grow up, parents gave you rules as you were growing up. You were already a part of the family, and then they established the rules. You had kid rules, you had teenage rules, you had high school rules, and then you outgrew the rules. You're still a part of the family, but the rules don't apply to you anymore. You don't have to obey the rules. You, when you were a kid, you had rules, but you didn't have rules so that you could be a kid. You were already a kid in the family when you got the rules applied to you. How many of you, and another thing about this family model is you don't apply these kid rules to somebody else's kids. Even though you've met kids that you wish you could apply some rules to. Right? You, you don't typically call over to your neighbor's house. Hey, can I talk to Susie? <laughs> Did you get your homework done? Okay, you're grounded. We know it only applies to the family. It's, it's a very basic set. It's a controlled set. It's a closed set. And that's the only people that are affected by your rules. So in a family set, the rules are for the one family. And every family is kind of different. Rules don't make you a part of the family. You already are a part of the family. So that's the family model of the rules. The second model is the club model. The club model, you all understand what the club model is. Club model is you decide you want to be a part of a club. They give you a contract or a set of rules. You decide if you want to follow them, and then you sign on the bottom line. And as long as then you adhere to those rules and agree to adhere to those rules, you're part of the club. At any point when you decide you don't want to be a part of the club anymore, you just quit following the rules. And you will be removed from the club. Break the rules, you're out. This could also be the employee model. You go to work for somebody, they give you a set of the rules. As long as you want to be an employee, keep the rules. When you're done keeping the rules, you're also done being a part. So in the first model, you get the rules after the relationship's established. In this model, you get the rules in order to establish the relationship. Get them, agree, and you're part. And then just for fun, we have the condo association model. Anybody live in the condo association? Yeah, the condo association model is kind of like this. There's a set of rules, but you're free to buy into the condo whether you keep the rules or not. They can't kick you out of the condo. They just can make you wish you didn't live there. You know, you start getting notes in your mailbox. Maybe a note on your, I, I went to one condo here on the island and they get one printed, she, she was getting notes on her door because her, her dog was leaving stuff somewhere, I guess. So they just, they just make your life a little bad, but they can't do anything about it. So you never really know where you are in that model. You know, it, today if you've kept the rules, they're okay with you. Tomorrow if you break the rules, you, you don't kind of feel like you fit in. It's, it's, always a little, it's always a little tear inside of you. I don't know if I want to be here. I'm kind of there anyway. You're always a part. And so the point is, whenever there's rules, you're in a relationship. The rules, the relationship, they go together. You cannot get away from it. So we transpose these ideas onto religion, and you can see why this gets pretty confusing. Because growing up, you picked one of those models. You understand that God is like one of those models. You've been raised to believe that God treats you like you're in one of those models. You all have a different category that you've picked. Some of you think that God loves you anyway, no matter what. Some of you think that if you do bad, God doesn't like you that day. Some of you think you have to act a certain way and then God will accept you. See, we can apply that model into our religious life and apply it to our faith. I am, how was it? Baby's first day in church. Oh, look. 
So which one is it? Are you in with God no matter what you do? But you have a set of rules to live by? Or if you behave and he lets you in, or you keep behaving and he won't kick you out? Where are you? I don't know. You've got to figure that out. To get a really good starting point, you've got to agree with God on the relationship and the rule relationship. You have to understand where he is in it. Some of you are thinking theologically now, and some of you are thinking emotionally. Some of you are trying to put God in this box, and it, it has to be this way, and this is how it always has been for me, and this is what I was taught, and God would never treat me that way. Some were taught one, but you never felt the other. You were taught that it's a family model, but you never really felt like you are part of the family. You were told you're a family of God. I don't feel like I'm family of God. Some of you were told that you could get in. If you acted a certain way, then God would accept you. And you never really, you tried and tried and tried, but you never really accept, felt, felt accepted. You'd kind of feel accepted, and then you feel like you get kicked down. You got one foot, what somebody said today, this week, one step forward, two steps back. That's kind of how you lived your life. You'll ask at some point in my life, how does my behavior Line up with God, and what does God expect to me, and how am I supposed to know? How am I supposed to kind of get it? So we're going to go all the way back to one of the oldest laws ever given. It's not the oldest, but it's one of the oldest, and about the third oldest in human history. But it is the best documented set of laws or rules that we've got. This set has made it into Judaism, it's made it into Christianity, and it's even made it into Islam. We call it... What? The Ten Commandments. Yeah, all three of those religions have the Ten Commandments in them. You, you may not knew that, but it is. Around 1446 B.C., the Ten Commandments made their uh, appearance known on the planet. They were given by God. All three majors believed that, that God gave the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. All of us believe the same thing about the Ten Commandments, or at least how we got them. Here's what's interesting about the Ten Commandments. You don't know all ten. Do you? Many of us know two, maybe three. Hardly any of you in this room know six. And it's really unheard of to find somebody who knows between eight and ten. Is that right? Try yourself. Test yourself. Express yourself. See if you know how many you got. But that's okay. Here's the other thing. If someone were to give you a Bible and say, are the Ten Commandments in there? You would go, well, yeah, they're in there. They're in there. Of course they're in there. Where are they at? They're in there. You don't know where they're at. Do you know where they're at? Somebody yell out where they're at. Oh, some of y'all are smart people. Many of you did not answer Exodus 20. But that's where the Ten Commandments are. They're in Exodus 20. Exodus chapter 20. Say that. Exodus 20. Some of y'all can go home. You've learned more about the Bible than you have in a long time. The Ten Commandments are in Exodus chapter 20. That's cool. Where's the Ten Commandments? Awesome. That's cool. So now when somebody asks you, you can say, oh, that's in Exodus chapter 20. Let me take you there and show you. And you'll be like, all oh, cool in their eyes. And be like, nice. But last week we talked about Abraham. So let me connect Abraham with this because, remember, Abraham is the actual starting point of faith. So but we've got to connect Abraham to the rules and figure out how it all kind of works out, okay? So Abraham, let's see that little thing I have put up there. Abraham was told by God, promised by God, that he would be a nation. Problem, Abraham didn't have any kids, okay? He wasn't going to be able. So him and Sarah, I don't know if it was Sarah's idea first or his idea first, they came up with this idea, Sarah can't have any kids. So she came to Abraham, and Abraham decided, yeah, your maiden, your servant, she can have kids. So, and if we have a kid, or y'all have a kid, then we'll have a kid. That's, we'll be fulfilling God's plan. Makes sense, right? I mean, it worked with Abraham. <laughs> so they did what they needed to do, and they had Ishmael, first child. Then, along comes Sarah. She ends up pregnant. She's pretty old, but she ends up pregnant. And Abraham has Isaac. So Abraham ends up with two sons. Now here's what's interesting. In Islam... Ishmael is considered the son of blessing. In Christianity, Isaac is considered the son of blessing. About 600 years after Jesus was on the planet, 
he come, uh, a, a prophet named Muhammad comes along and weaves this little story that connects the Arab nations back to Ishmael, back to Abraham. They got their starting point. But over on our side of the equation, we have Isaac, who had a couple of sons, Jacob. Okay, Jacob had 12 sons. One of those sons was named Joseph. Okay, Joseph. 11 sons didn't like Joseph because of his wardrobe. Okay, he had a prettier coat than they did. So they threw him in a pit. When they threw him in a pit, he ended up in Egypt. He became the prime minister of Egypt. And he was the prime minister when there was a big famine in the land. So a famine hits everywhere but Egypt. So uh, jo Joseph gets on Facebook and puts a post up that says, there's a famine everywhere, but we got tons of food. You need to bring the family. Come on over to our house. We'll cook Thanksgiving dinner, and y'all can stay for the millennium, which they did. They came over. And these 12 tribes, these 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. That was a lot. <laughs> so Abraham's great, great and great grandchildren grew up in Egypt. And they became a nation. They became a nation so big that the other Egyptians went to Pharaoh and said, hey, listen, these guys are multiplying like rabbits. And if you don't do something about it, there's going to be more Hebrews in Egypt than there are Egyptians, and that's a problem. So they devised a good plan. They just made all of the Israelites slaves. So they became a nation, but they were a slave nation. So for 400 years, 400 years, they were slaves in Egypt. Generation after generation, all they knew was slavery. They would get together and they would tell stories about Father Abraham. And they would talk about God's promise to him and how they were going to be a great nation. And somebody would, yes, you in the back. We're the great nation? Yes, yes, we are. Yes, we are. But we're slaves. Yes, yes, I know. But, but God promised to Abraham that we would be a, a great nation. Uh, yeah, you in the back. We're slaves. Yes, yes, I know. Quit asking those pesky slavery questions, okay? Because it's, it's just a problem. So for, I mean, can you imagine being told that? And your grandparents being told that? And your great-great-grandparents told that? And your great-great-great-great-grandparents told that? And then your great-great-great-great-great-grandparents being told that? At some point, you start going, we need some new stories. This story's not working. I don't believe the whole Father Abraham bit anymore. You can take him off the flannel graph. I mean, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? This is God's promise. You need to hold on to God's promise. Nah, it's been too long. Some of you are that way about Jesus coming back. Some of you are that way. Well, it hasn't happened. It's not going to happen in mine. 400 years these stories are told. Many just didn't get it. Many don't get it. Many don't get it today. Then one day, this man shows up. His name is Moses. He goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, Moses says, and Pharaoh says, let my people go. No. So, nature freaks out all up in Egypt's grill. I mean, there's locusts, there's boils, there's ticks. Water pollution. I mean, it's the first. I mean, PETA could have really had a heyday back then. I mean, the EPA, they were all over Moses. Really? Blood in the river? Come on. So if you know the story, eventually Pharaoh says, okay, you can go. Did you know that in the Quran, Moses is mentioned more than any other name at all? Isn't that cool? Some of y'all are going, what's the Koran? Just Google it. It's okay. So, and I say that because we, we agreed in week one, this is not Bible story time. We agreed that as an adult, if I were to tell you the Bible says, you would look back at me and go, had that.
didn't work. Give me something else. Everything we've used since week one has been historically challenged and um, lifted up, proven historically accurate. This story has made it 2,500 years. No, 4,000 years. Made it 4,000 years, this story has. In all the major religions, it's not made up. It's not just a Bible story. This is true historical fact. Everybody believes that Moses took the Hebrew people out of Egypt when they were slaves. They believe he led them out. All this, Egypt's economy gets wrecked. I mean, this didn't happen like over a week. And Pharaoh finally says, you got to get out of here. And about take everything you own, and if you want stuff we've got, take it. Just go. So Moses leads them out. About three weeks later, they end up in Mount Sinai. And Moses goes up to get God's law. Remember, all they know is slavery. They don't know their God. They only know slavery. They only know, what do you want me to do? I'll do it. What do you want me to do? I'll do it. Wouldn't it make sense for God to just give them some laws that they could go do? Wouldn't that make sense? How many of y'all believe that's why he got the Ten Commandments? They were slaves. They needed something to know how to do, right? Oh, you're scared. You're scared. Because I never ask you the right question first. Smart. So God gives this nation their first set of laws. Part of it is the Ten Commandments. And you can find it in your Bible. And That's awesome. You're smart. So let's read the introduction to the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20, verse 1, we get the introduction to the Ten Commandments because in it, we see a glimpse of the correlation between the rules and the relationship that God... Now, here's how it begins. Exodus chapter 20, verse 1, and God spoke all these words. So we know who's talking. I am the Lord your God. And to the people would have said, what? What do you mean? What do you mean you're my God? We haven't done anything. We're slaves. What do you mean you're the, who are you? What, how did you become our God? God would respond with, I just am. I am the God who brought you out of Egypt out of the land of slavery. I'm the God who looked in on you and sent a deliverer to you and brought you out of bondage. I'm the God who did that. I am your God. But we didn't do anything to make you do that. God would say, that's right. I am your God. In essence, I am your God, and you haven't done anything to make me your God. I am your God, and you haven't found any way to pay me back. You haven't, you're not going to find any way to pay me back. You didn't do anything to deserve for me to come get you out of slavery. I simply did it. And because I did it, I am your God. So that would make us your people. Yeah. God would say, that's right. You're my people. But we've been slaves, and now all of a sudden, you're our God. Yes, that's right. Just magically? Well, it's not really magic, but yes, it just happened. I am your God. And he goes on and says, I'm the one who brought you out of Egypt. Ah, this is huge. I am the Lord your God whom you have done nothing for. I am the Lord your God who sent this deliverer into you and rescued you when you had given up hope, when you had no, you, you were slaves so long. Probably part of the picture you slaves so long, you had no hope. You, had no, you didn't even know anybody to ask for. And I came in and brought you out. Uh, you didn't even expect it. And I came in. I am the Lord your God, and you haven't done a thing for me. That's right. We don't know what to do. We don't know what the rules are. How could we have done anything for you? How could we? God, how could you have ever expected it? I didn't expect anything. I am your God. I am your God. You are my people. And God would be like, I know. I know all that. And before I give you the rules, I want you to know you're mine and I'm yours. Before you get anything to do, before I tell you what you should do, we have to establish the fact that you are mine and I am yours. 
and then we can talk about the rules. You see, an interesting thing happened back in Egypt. Right before they left, after the locust, after the, after the boil, after the, the big stuff, you know, all the, the really pesky stuff. God, through Moses, told the people, tonight I want you to kill a lamb, which they did all the time. And he said, I want you to have a big dinner together as a family, which they did all the time. He said, but tonight I want you to take some blood from that lamb and I want you to put it over your doors. To which the people probably said, why? And God would say, trust me. But God, what difference is it going to make? Trust me. But God, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Trust me. And they did. Many of the Israelite people put the blood over their doorpost, down the side. And that night, angel of death came through Egypt, just swept through Egypt. But it passed over all the doors that had blood on it. And to this day, and, and from that day on, they celebrated that day. It's called Passover. That's why they didn't celebrate the rest. They celebrated the fact that they trusted God from that day. So basically, God is now looking back and going, that was me. That was me. You see, you trusted me. And that made you my people. You trusted me, and that's how I am now your God. And you are my people. Trust me. Trust me. And that next morning is when Pharaoh said, go. And don't come back. I just want you to trust me. So that three weeks later, then we have this guy. They're gathered at the foot. And Moses is giving them. And God has got the law given down. And God would say, now we have some laws. But let's not forget the most important thing. I am the Lord your God. And you are my people. And I am the one who delivered you from slavery. Even though you didn't even expect it to happen. And now there's some things I want you to do. As we learn to live as a people together. There's some things we need to do together. And he gave them the first commandment. Can you imagine? Here's some things you need to do. Here's the first commandment. You ready? No. You shall have no other gods before me. Can you believe that? <laughs> Can you Just think about it. You're the people. You just got the whole story, the fact that God rescued you from slavery for 400 years. You would look at God and go, that's what you want us to do first? Because they're in order. You, that's the first thing you want us to do? Have no other gods before you? Wait a minute. You're the God who delivered us from slavery. You rescued us. You've brought us out here. We now have a God. Our family, our kids have hope. We belong to something and something belongs to us. And the only thing you're really first worried about is we don't put any other gods before you. Put a check in that box. Right? And as many of you know, you've seen the rest of the story. Even though they put a check in that box, you just want to look at them and go, Really? Are you serious? What God did for you, and then this is what you this is how you pay him back. Isn't that the attitude you kind of have? Can you imagine all the people who's going to read your story? Really? That's what God did for you, and then that's what you did for him? It's really not about our story. It's really not about their story. It's about God picked them. God picked you. He chose you before you knew what it took to be one of his. Because it doesn't take anything to be one of his. You just are. Think about this. The Ten Commandments were a confirmation, not a condition of their relationship with God. The laws, the rules, the guidelines that the Bible lays out for you and I 
are confirmation, not a condition for you to be one of his. That's not how it works. God wasn't like, I'm going to give you ten things. And as long as you can keep about five of them, we're still going to be good. But if you break more than eight, I'm going to get some new people. It wasn't like that. So important. 1,500 years before Jesus. 2,100 years before Muhammad. As far back as you can go to connect law and God together, it didn't have to be this way. It could have been so conditional. God could have said, do these things and you will be my people. Do these things and you'll stay my people. He never said that. And yet you and I live every single day, most of the time, like that. Well, if I want God to love me, I better do this. If you want God to bless you, you better do this. Look, you've already look, look, look what God has given you already. God's got that for you. Now, if you're gonna if you're gonna get any more, you better do this because God's probably waiting now. He gave you some, and now he wants to see if you'll respond and he'll give you some more. That's how you and I live. Secular world calls it karma. You do good, you get more good. You do bad, you get more bad. And that's how you and I have treated God. And yet God, from the very, very beginning, from the first time men and women became children of God, he said, you just are mine. You just are. And granted, you and I raise our kids like we think God raises us. I'll put gas in your car as long as you do an errand for me. I'll pay your insurance as long as you do this. I've given you this, now I expect something from you. That's what we think God did for us, so that's how we treat them. And yet God, in his infinite wisdom, who knows how relationships work the best, said, you're mine, I love you, and nothing your foolhearted, stupid head will do will ever change that. Oh, and by the way, all those good things you're still getting, they're because you're mine. And I have taken the responsibility of moving you through life. And I'm going to continue to move you through life regardless of how pig-headed you are. Now, you can either enjoy it, and you can have the rules and the blessings, and you can understand why you have them a little better by going under the law. And make that a confirmation. Or you can keep living like it's a condition if you want. Doesn't really matter to God. He made it very clear to the nation of Israel. You're my people. And even though you haven't done anything to deserve it. You'll always be my people. Just don't have any other gods before me. That's basic. Just don't have any other gods before me. What else do I need to do to demonstrate the fact that you can trust me? And God would say that to you today. What else do I need to do for you that you'll trust me? Why is what I've done for you not enough so far? Why do you need so much just to say you trust me? Why do you have to trust me for one thing? I show you it's me, and then you won't go to the next thing until I've proven myself to you again. Why? Just don't have any other gods before me. And just like you're looking at that going, man, they were pretty dense. We're pretty dense. We really are. If you've ever read the Old Testament, you know Genesis, it's pretty fun. Good stories. Exodus, it's pretty fun. In, in Exodus, you get the Ten Commandments. They're in chapter 20. Then you get to Numbers, and you get to Deuteronomy, which is what you usually skip if you're reading the Old Testament, because it's like every time I start to read, I go to sleep. But then eventually you get to the prophets, and it's the same thing over and over and over. Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, Hezekiah, Malachi, they're all saying the same thing. And the prophets, here's what you need to understand when you're reading the prophets, it's God doing this. One, two, three, you're in timeout. One, two, three, you're in timeout. One time he put his kids in timeout for 70 years. 70 years. He said, you're in timeout, Babylon, right now. Don't come out of Babylon. And he left them there till that one generation was completely gone. 
but he never, ever gave up on them. Not because what they had done or hadn't done, but because he had chosen them. The history of Israel is God saying, it's not the club model. We're not going to do it that way. It's the family model. That's how he treated Israel, and that's how he treats you. And that's how he treats me. Bottom line is, as you start over, the rules confirm your relationship. They don't give you a condition of your relationship with God. You see, God only gives kids rules that he's already in a relationship with. He only talks to his kids. And man, if that's true, if that's true, you've got to decide if that's true in your life. That's staggering. Because just like Israel, who swung way far away from God many, many times, God kept disciplining them. Not to pay them back, but to bring them back. He didn't do bad things to them to get back at them. He did the things for and to them to get them closer to him when they walked away, just like a good parent. It says something about the expansiveness of his love and his mercy and his grace and his kindness. The fact that he keeps putting up with us, even though we don't think he ever should, he does. Man, that wasn't about Abraham, wasn't even about the nation of Israel. It's about all mankind. Remember the promise to Abraham? He told, God told Abraham, all the nations of the world, of the earth will be blessed through you. All the nations. Not just your nation. Not just the Arab nations. Not just everybody. All nations. Isaiah would come along and say, I'll make, here, here's Isaiah 49, right? I'll make you a light to the rest of us, to the Gentiles. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles. That's you and me. That my salvation may reach the end of the earth. It's never been about the Jewish people. He would look at them and say, you're a light, you're a signpost, you're a guide, you're the model. People are going to look at you and understand that's how I'm going to treat them. How I treat you is how I treat everybody. We should learn by that how the relationship to rules works. Just by the way he treated the Jewish people, the children of Israel. It should not surprise you that 1,500 years later, Jesus walks on the planet, and before he asks anything of anybody, he turns nature upside down. I mean, he talks to weather. He heals sicknesses. And then he says to them, trust me. Trust me. Because the promise that God fulfilled to Abraham and the promise that he fulfilled through Israel is a promise to all men and women. And then John, who knew, we'll finish with this, John who knew Jesus better probably than anybody. He's the guy that Jesus looked at from the cross and said, John, she's your mama now. He said, yet yeah, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become club members, condo association members, children, sons, daughters. Trust me. And now you're my child. Trust me, and now you're mine, and I am yours. Jesus said, as God accepted Abraham, as God adopted the children of Israel, the invitation has been extended to all people, which means it's the family model. Anything he requires of you is evidence of his love for you, that he wants you to benefit from this life and in this life. It's evidence that you have a pre-established relationship. So when you start to feel what you think is the squeeze from God, and you call it because you did something else, no, it's because God wants something from you. He wants you to be closer to Him. You're already His. And you're never ever going to not be His. You can trust me, because all along it's been about you. And that's where we'll pick it up next week. Let me give you your question as we walk out of here. You're not walking out too fast. Bikers for Babies is now going by. It takes about 30 minutes for that to happen. What? You can hear it. You can hear it. Here's your question for today. And you take it, mull it around, ask it out loud. Ask your wife what she had. Ask your husband what he had. Here's the question. When you were growing up, or as you were growing up, how did I word that? Growing up, did you feel like religion was based on the which three models? Not what I just showed you today. Not what did you think? 
when you were growing up? What did you think was the model? Was it the family model? Was it you were born into the family and God loves you no matter what? Do you believe that you had to do something in order to gain God's attention and to keep, keep him your God? Or did you just kind of never know where you stood? One day you were good, one day you were bad. One day you kind of felt godly, and the other day, eh, not so godly. You were kind of hiding from God. Oh, look at them go. Is that how you live? How, how did you live? What did you believe? And then when you said your prayers or went to Sunday school or heard sermons, you looked at them through that lens. And you made changes to your life based on what you thought God did and how he made you his. Hold on to that. And we'll work on it next week. Stand with me. And we'll be dismissed. Before we pray, let me tell you tonight is movie night back in the back building. Uh, it's just a time where we gather together, have fellowship, eat some appetizers together. That's at 6.30. Uh, and then we're watching the movie, Not Today. The movie's called Not Today. We are watching it today. Not Today. Uh, really good movie. The youth have already watched it, um, so uh, us adults are going to catch up with them uh, and, and watch that movie. Come check it out. It's a, very well done. It kept their attention, so we should be good. Uh, but if you want to bring your favorite appetizer, do that at 630. Uh, if not, just come and eat the appetizers everybody else brings. There's always plenty. Back in the back building, 630 tonight. Um, th- like I said, we have this week to do this. You can bring it. You can bring food tonight if you want. You can bring it Wednesday night. Uh, we'll get it to the right place. All you got to do is anytime we gather together, Bring it in. You bring it during the week, go to the office, and we'll uh, make sure it gets uh, in the right place. I pray God has walked us through these past few weeks, uh, restarting our look at our faith, and that we've got all the pieces in the right place, and then we're starting to build now. Starting next week, we're starting to build where we're going forward in our walk with Him. Let me pray for you, and we'll go. God, I thank you that um, you are providing for us, a set of rules that just prove we're already in a relationship with you. God, may we see from now on that your love for us is not conditional. Your love for us requires nothing from us. We didn't do anything to get it, can't do anything to keep it. We thank you for that. God, change our hearts if we don't thank you for that. Grow us closer to you. And as we walk out these doors, God, into our mission field, may everyone see us as children of God. In your name we pray. Amen.